Hey, welcome back everyone. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion on chapter three, and we're going to talk about measures of variation. We're going to discuss how to compute the range of a data set, as well as finding the interquartile range. And then we're going to spend most of our time on variance and standard deviation. So let's get started. So in the previous video, we discussed measures of center and location. Now we're going to be focusing on measures of dispersion or variation. So when describing our data, we're looking for the spread. When collecting data, we'll notice that the values of our variables of interest will take on different values. When we plot our data, it spreads around the center. So we want to see how that spread occurs. Variation occurs because not everything in our data set will have the same value. It will vary depending on a variety of factors. So when we're measuring variation, it is giving us information about our spread or how different they are from each other. So when we have a smaller value, that means there's less variation. When we have a larger value, that means we have more variation. So we can see in this diagram here, we have two shapes that represents our spread. The taller curve that is tighter or narrower means there's less variation because the values that we've collected are much closer together. Now the wider curve has greater variation because the numbers we collected are spread out much further from each other. So let's talk about range and interquartile range next. To calculate the range, we take our largest value or the maximum value and then subtract the minimum or the smallest value. This is the easiest form of measurement, but the downside is that it's very sensitive to extreme values. If you have a very large number or a very small number, but most of our data is somewhere in the middle, the range will get skewed. It also ignores how the data is distributed or the shape. Another type of range that we might want to calculate is the interquartile range. Recall, we learned how to calculate the first and third quartiles in the last video. To get the interquartile range, you take the difference between the first and third quartiles. This should look familiar here as this is a box and whisker plot. We have our first quartile at 30 and our third quartile at 57. So to get the interquartile range, we subtract those two numbers and that is the distance between the two quartiles. So this is our interquartile range of 27. This measure focuses on the data that is in the middle of our distribution and extreme values would not skew it. So variance and standard deviation are the most common measures of variation. We'll be using these throughout the course, so we'll spend more time on them in this video. Variance and standard deviation can be calculated on a population and a sample. So let's review how to calculate on a population first. The population variance is the average of the square distances of our data values from the mean. Here is our formula using different Greek letters. So let's review what each of these symbols represent. Mu is our population mean. Big N tells us our population size. And then sigma squared is our population variance. So what you're going to do in the formula is we're going to take each of our x's or the values that we're working with, and then we're going to subtract them from the mean. Then each of those values will square them. And then for each of those, we'll add them all up. And then we're going to divide by the population size. So variance is required to find our next measure, which is the standard deviation. This is one of our most common measures of variation, so let's review that now. To find the standard deviation, we must take the positive square root of the variance. You can see the variance formula here underneath the square root sign. This will allow us to have the same units as our original data. So in other words, our standard deviation is going to be in the same scale as the original data, whether we're working with dollars, weights, etc. So let's review an example next. So here is problem 3.26, and the data here reflects the number of times a population of business executives flew on business last month. Since this is a small company, 
and it only has six executives, that's why it would be considered a population because that's all the executives we have in the company. So to compute the range, we'll take the largest number and subtract the smallest number. So looking at our data set here, we can see that the largest number is nine and the smallest number is four. So when I subtract nine minus four, we get a range of five. As we know, the range is a simplistic form of variation. So in B here, we're gonna compute the variance in the standard deviation. We first must get our mean or our average. So as you recall, to get the average of something, we'll add up all of our numbers and then divide it by the population size. So when I add up my flights for our business executives, we get 35 and our big N or the population size is the six business executives. So if we divide these two numbers, we get 5.8333. So next, let's calculate our variance in standard deviation. When calculating the variance in standard deviation by hand, as we'll do in this example, I suggest using a table to make things easier. So the first thing we want to do is figure out our big N. So our population size is the six executives. So now using our formula right here, it's gonna ask us to work through the order of operations inside the parentheses first. We will take each of our X's and subtract it from our average or our mean that we calculated previously. The first executive had four flights last month. So we're gonna subtract the average number of flights or 5.8333 and we get negative 1.8333. So we're gonna do the same thing down the table for the rest of the executives, taking their number of flights and subtracting from the average. Then the next step is to work through our exponents. So we'll take the numbers from the first column and we're gonna square each one. So for the first executive, we calculated negative 1.8333. If we square this number, we get 3.361. So watch out for those rounding differences if you're doing this in a calculator or Excel. So we'll go ahead and take the squares in the rest of the table down. Now the next step we must do, according to the formula, is to sum or add everything up. So we can do that and we get 18.833. So finally, we're gonna take this number and we're gonna divide by the population size. So taking 18.833, and dividing by six, and we get 3.1389. Now, we're not done yet because the variance is not an original unit of measure since we squared the differences. In this problem, we are counting the number of flights each executive took. So what we must do is we must take the square root of our variance. So the square root of 3.1389 is 1.7717. In other words, we're saying that the variation in flights between our executives is 1.7717 flights. Let's look at the difference for the sample standard deviation. For a sample standard deviation, this is based on a sample data selected from the population. Now, if we look at our formula here for the sample variance, instead of sigma like you saw for the population variance, you see a lowercase s with a square. That's the symbol for sample variance. The formula is similar as the population variance where we're summing up the square differences. In this case, we are dividing by small n or sample size minus one. Then the sample standard deviation is the square root of the sample variance, just like we did with the population standard deviation. So let's wrap this up with another example for sample variance and standard deviation. So in part C, we're continuing with the same problem, but now we're gonna change up the story. Earlier, when we were looking at the six business executives, we said that there was an entire population. Now, let's imagine we have a much larger company and those six executives were not the only executives in the company. Imagine we took a sample, but we're using the same data points from before. We have the same 18.833 that we calculated before. Since it's no longer a population, the denominator will be the sample size of six minus one. If we divide these two numbers, we get a sample variance of 3.7667. So to get the sample standard deviation, we'll take my sample variance and take the square root of it and we get 1.9408. Now what you'll notice is that the statistic from our sample is larger than the parameters which we calculated in part B. The sample variance and sample standard deviation has a different divisor than the population. 
Our divisor here is n minus 1, so we're dividing by 5 instead of 6. The reason why sample statistics will have a larger variation than our parameters from the population is because we're not analyzing all the data. We must acknowledge that there's going to be more variation, and so that's why you see the difference when you're comparing statistics with population parameters. So let's compare standard deviations across different data sets. We can see here we got three different data sets that have all the same mean of 15.5. However, the sample standard deviations, or lowercase s, are different. In A, the sample standard deviation is 3.338. In B, it's 0.9258. And then finally in C, it's 4.57. We can see the spread of data in A and C is much wider than the data in B, which is very close together. When you compare A and C, C is more spread out because it has more data points further away from the center. Therefore, this is why standard deviations are so important because this tells us how much variation we have in our data. Well, that wraps up this video covering measures of variation. In the next video, we're going to wrap up chapter three and we're going to learn how to use the mean and standard deviation together.